No man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him. What is this drawing? How then does the Father draw men? Arminian defines generally say that God draws men by the preaching of the gospel. Very true. The preaching of the gospel is the instrument of drawing men. But there must be something more than this. Let me ask, to whom did Christ address these words? Why, to the people of Capernaum, where he had often preached, where he had uttered mournfully and plaintively the woes of the law and the invitations of the gospel. In that city he had done many mighty works and worked many miracles. In fact, such teaching and such miraculous attestation had he given to them that he declared that Tyre and Zidon would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes if they had been blessed with such privileges. Now, if the preaching of Christ himself did not avail to the enabling these men to come to Christ, it cannot be possible that all that was intended by the drawing of the Father was simply preaching. No, brethren, you must note again, he does not say no man can come except the minister draw him, but except the Father draw him. Now, there is such a thing as being drawn by the gospel and drawn by the minister without being drawn by God. Clearly, it is a divine drawing that is meant, a drawing by the Most High God, the first person of the Most Glorious Trinity sending out the third person, the Holy Spirit, to induce men to come to Christ. Another person turns round and says with a sneer, Then do you think that Christ drags men to himself, seeing that they are unwilling? I remember a meeting once with a man who said to me, Sir, you preach that Christ takes people by the hair of their heads and drags them to himself. I asked him whether he could refer to the date of the sermon in which I preached that extraordinary doctrine, for if he could, I should be very much obliged. However, he could not. But, said I, while well, Christ does not drag people to himself by the hair of their heads, I believe that he draws them by the heart quite as powerfully as your character would suggest. Mark, that in the Father's drawing there is no compulsion whatever. Christ never compelled any man to come to him against his will. If a man is unwilling to be saved, Christ does not save him against his will. How then does the Holy Spirit draw him? Why, by making him willing. It is true he does not use moral persuasion. He knows a nearer method of reaching the heart. He goes to the secret fountain of the heart, and he knows how, by some mysterious operation, to turn the will in an opposite direction. So that, as Ralph Erskine paradoxically puts it, the man is saved with full consent against his will, that is, against his old will, that he is saved. He is saved with full consent, for he is made willing in the day of God's power. Do not imagine that any man would go to heaven kicking and struggling all the way against the hand that draws him. Do not conceive that any man will be plunged in the bath of a Savior's blood while he is striving to run away from the Savior. Oh no, it is quite true that first of all man is unwilling to be saved. When the Holy Spirit has put his influence into the heart, the text is fulfilled. Draw me, and I will run after you. We follow on while he draws us. Glad to obey the voice which once we had despised. But the gist of the matter lies in the turning of the will. How that is done, no flesh knows. It is one of those mysteries that is clearly perceived as a fact, but the cause of which no tongue can tell and no heart can guess. The apparent way, however, in which the Holy Spirit operates, we can tell you. The first thing the Holy Spirit does when he comes into a man's heart is this, he finds him with a very good opinion of himself. And there is nothing which prevents a man coming to Christ like a good opinion of himself. Why, says man, I don't want to come to Christ. I have as good a righteousness as anybody can desire. I feel I can walk into heaven on my own rights. The Holy Spirit lays bare his heart, lets him see the loathsome cancer that is there eating away his life, and covers to him all the blackness and defilement of that sink of hell, the human heart. Then a man stands aghast. I never thought I was like this. 
Oh, those hens I thought were little. It swelled out to an immense stature. What I thought was a molehill has grown into a mountain. It was but to hiss upon the wall before, but now it has become a cedar of Lebanon. Oh, says the man within himself, I will try and reform. I will do good deeds enough to wash these black deeds out. Then comes the Holy Spirit and shows him that he cannot do this takes away all his fancied power and strength, so that the man falls down on his knees in agony and cries, so once I thought I could save myself by my good works, but now I find that, could my tears forever flow, could my zeal no respite, no, all for sin could not atone, you must save, and you alone. Then the heart sinks, and the man is ready to despair, and he says, I never can be saved. Nothing can save me. Then comes the Holy Spirit and shows the sinner the cross of Christ, gives him eyes anointed with heavenly high fall, and says, Look to yonder cross. That man died to save sinners. You feel that you are a sinner. He died to save you. And he enables the heart to believe and to come to Christ. And when it comes to Christ, by the sweet drawing of the Spirit, it finds a peace with God which passes all understanding, which keeps his heart and mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, you plainly perceive that all this may be done without any compulsion. Man is as much drawn willingly as if he were not drawn at all. And it comes to Christ with full consent, with as full a consent as if no secret influence had ever been exercised in his heart. But that influence must be exercised, or else there never has been, and there never will be any man who either can or will come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, says one, if what this man preaches is true, what is to become of my religion? For you do know, I have been a long while trying, and I do not like to hear you say a man cannot save himself. I believe he can, and I mean to persevere. But if I am to believe what you say, I must give it all up and begin again. My dear friends, it will be. Remember, what you are doing is building your house upon the sand. And it is but an act of charity if I can shake it a little for you. Let me assure you in God's name, if your religion is no better foundation than your own strength, it will not stand at the bar of God. Nothing will last to eternity but that which comes from eternity. Unless the everlasting God has done a good work in your heart, all you may have done must be unraveled at the last day of account. It is all in vain for you to be a church-goer, or a chapel-goer, a good keeper of the Sabbath, an observer of your prayers. It is all in vain for you to be honest to your neighbors and reputable in your own conversation. If you hope to be saved by these things, it is all in vain for you to trust in them. Go on. Be as honest as you like. Keep the Sabbath perpetually. Be as holy as you can. I would not dissuade you from these things. God forbid. Grow in them, but oh, do not trust in them. For if you rely upon these things, you will find that they will fail you when you most need them. And if there is anything else that you have found yourself able to do unassisted by divine grace, the sooner you get rid of the hope that has been engendered by it, the better for you. For it is a foul delusion to rely upon anything that flesh can do. A spiritual heaven must be inhabited by spiritual men, and preparation for it must be worked by the Spirit of God. Well, cries another, I have been sitting under a ministry where I have been told that I could, at my own option, repent and believe, and the consequence is that I have been putting it off from day to day. I thought I could come one day as well as another. I had only to say, Lord, have mercy upon me and believe, and then I should be saved. Now you have taken all this hope away from me. Sir, I feel amazement and horror taking hold upon me. Again, I say, my dear friend, I'm very glad of it. This is the effect which I hope to produce by God's grace. Pray that you may feel this a great deal more. When you have no hope of saving yourself, I shall have hope that God has begun to save you. It's an easy to say, oh, I cannot come to Christ. 
Lord, draw me, help me. I shall rejoice over you. He who has got a will, though he has not power, has grace begun in his heart, and God will not leave him until the work is finished. But careless sinner, learn that your salvation now hangs in God's hand. Oh, remember you are entirely in the hand of God. You have sinned against him, and if he wills to damn you, you will be damned. You cannot resist his will or thwart his purpose. You have deserved his wrath. And if he chooses to pour the full shower of that wrath upon your head, you can do nothing to reverse it. If, on the other hand, he chooses to save you, he is able to save you to the very uttermost. But you lie as much in his hand as a summer of the moth between your own finger. He is the God whom you are grieving every day. Does it not make you tremble to think that your eternal destiny now hangs upon the will of him whom you have angered and incensed? Does not this make your knees knock together and your blood curdle? If it does, so I rejoice. Inasmuch as this may be the first effect of the Spirit's drawing in your soul, I tremble to think that the God whom you have angered is the God upon whom your salvation or your condemnation entirely depends. Tremble and kiss the sun, lest to be angry, and you perish from the way while his wrath is kindled but a little.